thank you so much. And, and also, uh, I really appreciate uh, the opportunity to present at this conference. So I've heard about it so many years and I thought, oh, this would be, this would be a super, super um, a conference to be involved in. Uh, so the, the title of this, this talk is Technical Challenges in Open Metadata. And Open Metadata is a project that I've been working on for probably about four years um, in an attempt to create an ecosystem where metadata, that is information about data sets and the IT systems around them and how, it, how the data is being processed, what it means, how it should be used. Um, um, it, it, you know, this, so, this, so this, this idea of uh, this descriptive knowledge um, is uh, is managed, and uh, the way we are where we are at the moment is that we have a huge number of extremely good metadata standards, but each covers a sp very specific aspect of the bigger picture. Uh, we also have uh, tools that uh, different vendors have built or different open source projects have built, and they themselves have metadata capability within them but it's a sort of private store of knowledge. And so this particular project was about, well, can we create an open platform, an exchange mechanism to allow knowledge from different tools and knowledge used by different types of professionals across an organization? Can we get that metadata flowing so that as people build on each other's knowledge, that knowledge base becomes more valuable and then it's open up to um, additional use cases. So that was the brief four years ago. And since then I've been working with different companies um, and lots and lots of different use cases. And we started um, an open source project called ODP Nigeria about um, just over two years ago. Um, and so today I'd like to share the results of uh, what we've been doing um, and go into uh, a number of the, the rather interesting technical challenges we've had along the way um, in building the software so far. So let's just see if we can get to page forward. There we are. So why does this matter? So, you know, I mean, so many, we've been through so much in the last six months. And for many organizations, they have had to uh, make, make some very quick decisions, some assessment and change the way they work um, to allow uh, their employees to operate safely, to maintain their commitments to their customers. Um, and so it has been a time of rapid change. And one of the things that helps that rapid change is to understand the resources that you have and where they're located and what they are capable of doing so that you can, you can, you can make an assessment and redeploy them to change the way that you work. Um, now, what's happened uh, for many organizations, they have a whole set of tools um, organized around the current way that they work and the current teams that they have. And those tools, as I said, have their own knowledge base, their own metadata locked inside a private database. And that's fine when the organization is continuing to operate in the way it always has. But in times of change, these silos actually prevent the organization from understanding what's going on and different parts of the organization may get a different view of the situation, which can, uh, which can lead to delays and, uh, and mistakes. So really what we're looking at doing is, is not to sort of say, well, we need a centralized metadata repository that everything connects to. That's clearly never gonna work. We need to allow these tools to exchange knowledge with high fidelity um, in an open way, completely open, completely fair. Um, and that was, the, that was the challenge that we picked up. So I thought it would be helpful to go through a small example, uh, just to give you an idea of what we're trying to achieve. So um, for many organizations, particularly those in regulated industries, uh, they find it very helpful to define the terminology they use for business. It helps people who are new to the organization. It helps create clarity in the way that people communicate. And it also helps to define very clearly what types of data need to be stored and, um, uh, it, and uh, sort of how it's formed, what the rules are, the regulations associated with it. 
So this is often called a glossary or as I called it here, an encoded vocabulary. Now this vocabulary is obviously in the language of the business. So uh, the business is also able to say, well, this thing called credit card number, that's uh, financial information and it's personal information. And, and it, it actually needs to be treated with a lot of respect uh, because if we lose this information, then a lot of harm will come to the individual whose card number it is. So the business is able to talk about the requirements for management, for governance, uh, any special reporting or procedures that need to happen around that data because they're experts both in their business and the, um, uh, and the regulations that, that govern it. So um, there's, you know, they don't need to know any IT to actually encode this vocabulary, not just with the meanings, but also with all these extra requirements and rules associated with it. Now let's start to think about building systems. And uh, typically uh, when we're passing data across APIs or we're storing data in databases, that data is structured and or the description of how that data is structured is, is described in a schema. And for many, um, you know, sort of in, for, for, for uh, regulated industries, often you see these schemas being tagged with the terms from the glossary. So effectively, if you think about this as a graph, you've got the description of all the fields linked to what they mean, which is the, the, the terms in the, in the vocabulary. And then those are linked to all the requirements associated with it. Um, so people can then look up when they're looking at a database table, for example, they can say, oh, I see this field here, uh, um, C number is actually the credit card number um, because I can see from the definition. Now, if we, it's, it's nice that people can look that up, but what's even more effective is if that information is available to the developers who are building new function. So um, <clears throat> I've been working with a company that have taken the Swagger tooling and put a search box on it and the developers type in the uh, name of the object that they want to pass over their API. So say they want to have an API for um, retrieving a customer. So they want to return the customer record. Um, and so they type customer in and then they get the JSON payload for that customer record. Um, and they can put it into their API um, and it saves them a lot of time. They haven't had to type it in and it saves them rework more importantly because they know they've got every field that they need. Um, and it's a standard format for everybody who's working with customer data. The other thing that's very important is that that schema is also tagged with the terms from the original glossary. So this knowledge has flowed and it helps the developer again, they can look and understand the data that they're getting, but the value adds when they then deploy it and push it into the DevOps pipeline, because the DevOps pipeline can now use those tags to make decisions. Oh, wait a minute, this API is passing personal information. It needs special protection. It needs to go into a particular um, secure gateway. Uh, the database needs to be encrypted. Uh, maybe extra tests need to be run to make sure that um, the data is being properly managed and, 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 and you know, and it cannot be um, damaged in any way. So um, the DevOps pipeline now is taking advantage of this knowledge. Um, and, uh, and so we have uh, taken all that work that was done to create the vocabulary and really speeded up the process of creating new um, digital services um, for, you know, from a, um, from a development point of view. So we, we, by, by flowing that information through the tools, uh, we are adding the value and we're making sure that developers are more efficient, but also their work is far more accurate when it comes to meeting regulations. Now, time passes and uh, that application has been in production a while and has been gathering some very interesting data in its database. And, uh, there's, there's a decision, well, let's do some analytics on that data. Let's try and understand our customers better. Um, and so uh, a data scientist is then pointed and told about the database um, and then provisions it into their tool. Now, because of this process, that database is tagged effectively with all the knowledge from the, um, from the, the original encoded vocabulary. So when that data is then copied into the data science tool, two things happen. The data scientist knows exactly what data they're getting in those fields because they can look them up in the vocabulary. 
but also the process that provisions data into the data science tool may actually go, the data scientist does not need to know the credit card number <laughs> of every one of our customers. And so that could be removed um, or masked, or maybe some things like date of birth could be obscured in some way. So here we have yet another value that's come from the fact that we are bringing the metadata with the data as it flows, as it's redeployed into different types of IT artifacts and then consumed by a new group of people using a new group of tools. So this is the dream that we're trying to achieve with, um, with Egeria. Um, and we've built this in an open source project. It's something that's hosted in OD Player, which is part of the Linux Foundation, so that it is an open, fair environment. And that, pro that, uh, that uh, sort of theme of openness and fairness is something that we've built into the platform as well, so that there is no central control, there is no sort of single centralized database. The aim is that we make those blue arrows as open and as fair as possible, um, so that um, as many tools uh, as possible can be a part of this ecosystem. So what are we trying to do? To share knowledge between people and processes uh, that use different tools and technologies. Um, and of course, this is a major, major undertaking when you think about how many tools and technologies and different types of people using technology today. Um, and uh, so this is most certainly a multi-year project um, and will have a very profound change in the industry. Um, and part of its process is around changing people's expectations about metadata management. So if you think, um, you know, 20 years ago, when you bought a laptop, you didn't get security on it. Today, you would not buy a laptop if it didn't have security on it. You expect that to be embedded. Our long-term dream is that Egeria is embedded in these tools by default and speaks open metadata by default. So that's our aim is that eventually no one will even think about Egeria because it is a key part of what everybody, everybody expects in every tool. Another reason why it has to be open source, freely available, and also visible for people to inspect as we build it to make sure that it covers their needs. <clears throat> and we do know that many people see the value of this integration and have tried lots of different techniques. So we have taken that experience into account as we've built a jury. So, um, you know, we, we, we really are looking to create a solution for the industry rather than for a particular, uh, a particular technology or um, set of uh, tools. And so, as I said, open source, we work very collaboratively with lots of different organizations and people who are planning to deploy this stuff. You know, they have their own rules, they, they come from different industries and that creates um, a, uh, you know, that, that helps us um, create the, um, the, the, the right level of uh, definitions for this environment. This fairness is so important. So this is a peer-to-peer -peer architecture. No, 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 no one product is in control. Even Nigeria is not in control. It is designed to be embedded into different, different technologies um, and it works um, as I say, in, in, a, in a flat exchange. Basically. The other thing that we realize is that not everybody has very large IT departments. And so this needs to be as self-managing as possible. It needs to have very clear diagnostics. It needs to be easy for people to set up and use so that it's useful, not only in very large enterprises, but also in small organizations where you may have uh, sort of technical people doing research, doing, you know, using data in a very sophisticated way, but they don't want to spend a lot of time managing their infrastructure around their tools. And so we need to make it easy to run. It also has to scale. You think about modern systems where it's, you know, you've got stuff running out on the edge, you know, with lots of sensors right out in, in, the, in, in, the, in the furthest reaches of the environment. We've got the on our mobile phones. The, you know, the mobile phone is a, is a data platform that's, uh, collecting data, it's processing, it's making decisions, it's distributing data. So it's important. Um, and also we have to think about very large scale 
um, highly available global cloud deployments as well. So it has to be able to handle all of these things. And part of that is what we is, is multi-tenant support. So that we need to be able to support um, m multiple organizations coming into the same cloud service but having their data partitioned within it so there's no um, cross-contamination of, of knowledge between different organizations. The other thing that we found was that, um, and, we'll, and I'll go into a bit more detail about what this means in a little while, but um, the siloing effect of the tools actually limited visibility. And um, a lot of um, security was enabled because people logged on to different tools and so they never saw the full picture. Now we've brought it together, we also need to be able to re-establish uh, visibility rules and rights as to who is allowed to update certain pieces of metadata, particularly as we start to use that metadata to govern and manage the environment, um, you know, the, I mean the whole ecosystem of tools. So we have to make sure that it's trusted and um, the integrity is maintained. And finally, it has to run everywhere. So we need to be able to customize it. So there is a connector framework that sits in the technology and every piece of external um, dependency is managed through connectors. So um, achieving that, as I say, is not the work of one organization. It's not the work of one team. It requires experience from a very wide range of people and so typically what we're doing is we look at a challenge and we bring in experts from lots of different um, uh, sort of organizations and also people who are just interested because their questions really help us think through the problem because we need to think differently from the way that tools are traditionally built and that, um, and, and so it's that diversity um, and openness that helps us to do that. Um, and you'll see as we go through that um, it has created some very interesting results. Uh, and this is just a summary of the achievements of two and a half years of working in this um, open space. Prior to this project, I hadn't worked in open source before, and I am deeply impressed about how much speed and the focus and the energy that people put in to just making this do the thing it needs. It's, it's, uh, it, it's actually been a very um, enriching experience to work in, um, in um, to work in this, sorry about the phone, <laughs> to work in this type of environment. Um, so let's start looking at the technology and uh, go down a little bit into a little bit more detail um, and show you some of the innovations that we have uh, developed over the years. So um, this first picture is really showing a sort of very stylized view of uh, Egeria in operation. And the first thing you notice is that the tools repository of metadata hasn't gone away. It's still there. So we're, we're not asking tools to be rewritten in order to use Egeria. But what we do is we put in the capability around that repository to allow it to exchange. And it might be that it, it, we are sort of sitting on the outside doing an adapter type pattern um, and doing the translation and all of the uh, distribution uh, logic ourselves, or it might be our libraries are inside, maybe embedded inside that product to allow it to talk out natively through, um, through our communication. Um, because and one of the reasons why we've invested so much in the actual logic of exchanging information is that um, there are huge impedance mismatches it, between the capability of each tool as we, um, as we connect it together. And it's our intention that every tool can continue to offer, operate at its, max, its maximum capability and Nigeria will take up the strain. So we're not about bringing everything down to the lowest common denominator. We're trying to allow every tool to be as good as it can be and use Nigeria to fill in the gaps wherever is needed. And so we've created a common language and data structures to allow people to express the metadata that their tool supports in it using a common framework, basically, because we, we not only need to get the bits and bytes across the network, but it has to be done with integrity. So if this piece description from this tool is about a database column, 
when it's stored in this tool, it still has to be about a database column. So the uh, sort of the, um, the, the semantics of the metadata has to be preserved as we move it between tools, even when they use different names for the same thing. Um, and uh, so we, ha we have um, around these data structures and things, we have the, um, we have a set of APIs that are each designed for specific types of technology. And this helps reduce the chance of um, people putting different types of metadata in, uh, in the wrong place, basically. If you imagine this huge um, area where, data, where metadata can be described, uh, we want to make sure that, that there is consistency in the way that the, uh, the types and, and language is used within the, within the Ageria ecosystem. And we also host all of the extra stuff that's needed around a particular tool in order for it to communicate. So, um, and it's not just about, um, uh, you know, sort of providing a, a sort of runtime, but it's about managing the starting and stopping and configuring and diagnostics and uh, uh, sort of uh, auditing of that exchange. And that's all handled in the Ageria uh, runtime. So, um, so if you looked at it from a high level uh, sort of single chart picture, then you could say that open metadata and governance, that's a jury as uh, sort of a, um, descriptive name. Um, what you would see is lots of different types of tools with a connector that is exchanging their metadata and their API into a jury's API and passing it into a jury and then a jury is responsible for the distribution of that information. So you might, for example, have a data platform that has a data that has a database on it. That would that metadata would be shared, and then a BI tool, so a reporting tool, business intelligence tool, would then pick that up and build a report on it. And that report then might be shared and then used by a governance tool to display the status of something. So this is um, sort of the, this central piece is pushing and pulling metadata to each of the tools according to their needs. Um, the nice the thing about nice high level architecture pictures is um, that it's easy to forget that the world is incredibly diverse and distributed. So um, if I put, click on the next picture, this is where Ageria is in orange. Um, Egeria is actually located in all of the places and then communicates with itself and that's how it does the, the exchange. And um, not only does it do the sort of active live exchange within an organization, but maybe where you've got two business partners exchanging data, um, because of Egeria is an open, uses an open format for metadata, it's also possible to create an archive of metadata that belongs, that accompanies the data. Um, in the same way that metadata for a digital photograph accompanies the actual photograph itself. Uh, so that, that metadata, which might include descriptions, classifications, um, terms and conditions for the data's use, that can then be loaded into the receiving organization's metadata repository and then used within that organization. Here's another picture of the same ecosystem to, to give us um, a, a reference for actually going down into the tech, technology itself. So um, in each of the environments, so it's the, the sort of, you imagine the different cloud platforms and data centers are represented by the green clouds. You put a platform, a Nigeria platform, and those are the blue boxes. Um, and those platforms host the connectors to the different technologies. Um, the connectors themselves run inside a logical server, and those are the orange circles, and we call those OMAG, or Open Metadata and Governance, or OMAG servers. So we have an OMAG server platform in each location with one to many OMAG servers sitting on it. And the, uh, the servers themselves, um, as I say, they host these connectors, and every single connector in Nigeria, whether it's a connector for the, the runtime or a connector to connect to a third party, support is, is all using the same connector framework throughout Nigeria. Uh, and this means that the way plugins are done is completely consistent across, uh, across the technology. So you only have to learn one type of plugin uh, mechanism. 
Um, the other thing is that these servers, those little yellow circles on the on the um, sort of the cloud diagram, um, are actually there are different types of servers for different types of integration. And in the center, we have what is uh, are the metadata repositories. So the tools that themselves feel that their primary purpose is to manage metadata. So we have them communicating in that peer to peer way in what we call as a cohort. So this is a group of metadata servers that are sharing metadata. And with that process, we are now creating a sort of virtual metadata store that is distributed amongst all those cohort members as they're called. Now that's great because we now have a, an enterprise view effectively of metadata, um, but ideally we want to use it. We want it to, provide value and, and help in that sharing of knowledge. And so that's the role of the governance servers. Um, and they are, you could say that they're a, a stopgap for the time for, um, for, for now, because many technologies, of course, don't know anything about Algeria, so they don't call Algeria directly. Um, so the governance servers act as a go-between. They are effectively pushing and pulling metadata between the third party technology shown in green um, and the cohort. So as they share metadata with um, the repository in there, in the, in there um, that's in the cohort, that repository then shares it to the rest. And this is how uh, we distribute the metadata across everybody who's connected. So the governance servers give us that active and we call that governance, uh, integrated governance because it's, it's actually actively using metadata to, um, to create uh, um, sort of control and management within the organization. And then finally, we, we have to support people and people need to see the metadata, use it. Um, and so we have view servers that are responsible for supporting user interfaces and they might be called by um, a tool, a, a third party tool, for example, or it might be one of our um, interfaces that uh, are supported by Algeria itself. Um, and this is just another view of the, the different types of servers sort of in a type hierarchy to show, to show uh, what we have. And I'll, and I'll start talking a little bit about, um, you know, sort of the, those different types in a second. But I thought, first of all, I would sort of reiterate that the platform itself that these servers run on is highly configurable and, and highly scalable in the way that it can support um, very small scale deployments so around the edge of the network, as well as uh, multi-tenant environments where you've got all the different servers you might need on a single platform or, or using highly available um, configurations where a single server is hosted on lots of platforms so we can do rolling updates or if one platform um, decides to part this world the server is still available. Now let's start talking about how the cohort works so um, many of the things I've talked about that you know each piece has been carefully thought through to fit in this this broader environment and, um, and you know just building a platform but there are lots of platforms around uh, the cohort itself we have here is, um, is in itself a quite a unique piece of technology because there, apart from a topic, a Kafka topic in the center, all of the logic is controlled by the members. And so the members choose when to connect and what to share and what to receive. And they also maintain a list of all the other members that they're communicating with in their own copies. There's not a central registry that's associated with the cohort. Um, and because organizations, you know, have different parts to it, um, as well as sort of corporate type organizations, it's possible for a particular repository to join one to many cohorts, and they will basically see all metadata in all of the cohorts that they connect to. So the chief data office here is seeing both metadata from both cohort A and cohort B in this process. And we do this, um, through a, a registration process. Uh, and so here I've got server one, it wants to join the cohort. So it's, it's got this central topic um, and it's called the RMRS topic for um, <laughs> interesting reasons. Uh, but basically it puts a registration document onto into the topic and just sits and waits. 
And when another server comes along and puts its registration document in, they then exchange registration information and they're configuring their own um, their, their, their own uh, technology, basically. Um, and so once that's exchanged, uh, they each know each other's network address. And that means that they're able to call one another. So here we see server, the pink server, server one, issuing requests to server two. So blue metadata is appearing in the, in the pink tool and the blue tool is showing pink metadata. Um, so that's, you know, that's, that's, that's working just from the registration process. But we also have um, uh, replication happening in the background to allow some metadata that's highly, it's used um, a lot and is also, um, and it may be, um, it, it is, it's very slowly changing. So it's, it's reasonable to copy it. Um, is automatically distributed behind the scenes. So if server two goes away, server one can still see key parts of the server two metadata. So we use both federating queries and replication behind the scenes to allow a high quality of service in terms of the availability of the metadata. In sort of it, between the repositories, the, the Ageria logic is maintaining um, a view of metadata that's like a massive virtual graph of nodes, we call these entities, relationships between these nodes, and additional classifications, which are like extra information that a tool has added to the original description. And we call, yeah, as I say, we call them classifications, and there can be properties, different types of properties associated with any one of these things. And what we're doing behind the scenes is we're shuffling stuff around. Um, so here we've got the two servers we had before. So the pink server's got a description of a database column and the blue server has the description of a glossary term. So one of them might be, um, you know, one of them might be a, a column called um, C number and the other one is a glossary term, which is credit card number. So it's just, I mean, it's a description of what is a credit card number. Now we want to associate them. So we can do a number of things. We can take what we call a reference copy, which is locked as read only into OMAG server one and OMAG server one can create that relationship. Um, and that's great as long as OMAG server one um, uh, is able to support both glossary terms and meanings um, because you know, basically we just bought it all together. The fact that the reference copy is there um, is, uh, is, is actually very important because if, if, if a user for OMAG Server 1 wants to update that glossary term, Nigeria will automatically route the upgrade, update to where it's what we call the home copy, which is the read-write copy in OMAG Server 2. That update happens and then the results go back and update the reference copy in OMAG Server 1. So we have a very strict rule as to who is allowed to update um, metadata but it can be initiated from any of the members of the, of the cohort. So the end users are not really aware that their local copy is a read-only copy uh, because that their updates can be rerouted. Re okay, so this is a situation where server one supports glossary terms and meaning relationships. Um, if they don't, so these two tools support metadata that needs to be linked, but neither of them support the other, then we can bring it into a third repository maybe read-only copies because they're, um, the read-write is in the original um, server, and then we can establish the meaning. Now, it actually doesn't matter which approach we use because when, I, when a user asks for metadata, they will get the three objects connected together irrespective of exactly where they're stored. Uh, and that's the piece that Nigeria does for the tools that are part of, are, are part of the ecosystem. The other thing that can happen is um, you might want to add governance and your tool might not support governance. So here we've, we've, we've labeled this particular glossary term as this is confidential data. And that means that other tools that extract that definition can see that even though the original tools didn't support it. So not only can we link things together, we can also augment it with our classifications as well. And this is very important where you've got regulations and things that come after the tools have been bought and they need to, we, and, and, and the metadata needs to be augmented with the new requirements from the regulation. <clears throat> so that was the technology. Um, 
the, the next thing to think about is what type of metadata have we covered? And as I said before, there are a lot of really good standards, but they are limited in scope. So there was a huge piece of work to go through all the, the sort of popular standards of metadata, extract what they describe, um, and then look for overlaps and uh, link these things together. So effectively we built a patchwork quilt of standards. It means that we can then exchange metadata with uh, systems that are using the standards and also uh, maybe pull metadata in from one standard and push it out through another. So we're able to interchange in as much as they overlap, but we also fill in the gaps between the standards because the standards are designed for very specific purposes. And the result is 500, about 500 types of metadata linked together um, in a model that is part of the Egeria project. Um, and we also, as I, I know when I mentioned about these specialized services, so we call these the, the, the sort of the, the piece that does all the exchange in the cohort is called the repository services. Uh, and that works with entities, relationships and classifications. Um, but that's quite hard for um, application developers who are integrating a tool to use. So there are access services that talk about glossary terms and database columns and things like that, the things that they would recognize. And so uh, we have access services that focus on each of the different types of tools we support at the moment. And I expect that that list will grow as we focus on increasing the uh, broader range of use cases and start to identify new interfaces that are needed uh, to help with this integration. Um, so uh, what else have we got? We've got, uh, uh, I've talked about these governance services that push, push and pull uh, the metadata. And this is showing the different patterns of um, connectors that we support. Um, and here we've got an example of that being used to extract information about data sets data stores, uh, databases, files, and things like that from the file system, and using those to automatically update um, a data virtualization, so a sort of data federation or view system, uh, so that uh, there's sort of a single access point to access the data that then pushes through to the original pieces. So we're showing here automatic um, exchange and or distribution of metadata used and being used to then reconfigure another technology. Um, another area I talked about is the fact that we needed to reduce the visibility, the, restrict the visibility of metadata to different groups of people. And so the governance zones are logical groupings of different types of assets. Uh, and they can, and an asset can be members of different zones um, uh, simultaneously. So you, you could sort of organize your zones on different, uh, different principles. Um, and, um, and then we can use um, these zones to attach different types of rules to, um, the, uh, to, to, to the zones themselves, which will then control how the assets within the zones can be used. And then attach the zones to different APIs to say only assets from this API can, uh, sorry, from this zone can come through this API. So you can reduce the, the um, visibility two different tools, two different users, depending on how they connect into the ecosystem. The other piece is metadata security within the server. So there are various places where we challenge a request at the, uh, the server boundary, particular service, particular operation within the service. And then there's data centric security as well. So each asset, um, there's a, an opportunity for the security, security plugin to um, say, oh, actually, this user is not allowed to see this asset or um, is not allowed to see this connection. So the connection may have passwords and give high privilege status to accessing a particular um, resource. Um, and so use of that connection may be restricted to certain types of users. Uh, and so that, um, that challenge can happen. And then, of course, at every repository level, we can, we can control what data is is met, what metadata is shared, um, sort of um, sort of at the core core level as well, and this allows uh, an organisation to um, adjust how they restrict um, not just visibility as you read, but also who is allowed to update, 
um, and use for different purposes, uh, use, use um, particular method, pieces of metadata for different purposes. Um, and finally, something that um, is extremely important when you're sharing metadata is to know where it came from. And so every piece of metadata has a header in it, an audit header that tells us um, not only its type and where it, and who's been updating it, and uh, um, but also uh, where it came from and what technology was involved. Uh, and that not only is useful for this sort of traceability, but also it controls who's allowed to access or who's allowed to update the metadata um, in the in the broader ecosystem. Uh, another thing we talked about the fact that this needs to be self configuring and easy to diagnose anything going wrong. So it does have an audit log framework that produces messages that are fully externalized, they can be translated. Uh, and uh, they include a description of what, what happened and what the, um, the team running the server has to do to actually uh, fix it. And we can route those to lots of different places, depending on how the um, organization manages their um, IT operations. <sighs> People, um, originally um, Ajira was gonna be a backend service, but we've had so many requests that people wanna see what's going on inside. And so this is an example of uh, one of our user interfaces called the Repository Explorer that allows you to connect to a Nigeria server and then explore the metadata irrespective of where it's located um, as if it was all one big database. Um, there are other um, explorers to look at the types for, that were supported in a particular tool or to um, actually understand how all of the different servers are connected uh, to the different technologies so that you can sort of get a, a top topological view of the ecosystem. Mandy, it's a five minute notice. Thank you very much. Thank you. Nearly there. <laughs> um, and so um, we've talked to lots of vendors about this and, and, and we're seeing some patterns emerging. So some of the um, so, so, so some vendors have sort of two versions of a platform and you and an old, and they, they use Ajira to uh, synchronize metadata from the old to the new to help customers migrate. Uh, they might have different versions of the product in, in production or uh, various other means to get access to more uh, metadata or to use the open source to get rid of some of the uh, um, maintenance costs they have in terms of creating integration to different technologies. Um, and so, um, the way we've been working is uh, it's very modular and we've just been building up the modules because we um, because we have um, we want to be very open there there are some modules that are released and are in production and there are other other modules that are sort of a skeleton of an api or maybe just the design document associated with it so when you look at the modules you need to make sure you're you're looking at something that's actually completed if you want to run it um, but if you are interested, then please collaborate with us and, and help us improve any particular piece that uh, still needs work on it. Um, and we've started really at the bottom and, and our technology is rising up. So the green means that it's, it's sort of pretty much finished. Uh, the orange means that there's work in progress and the red means it's really a design idea at this moment. Um, and this is roughly where we're going. We release every month, so it's a constantly changing picture. Um, and um, yeah, so uh, it's an extremely exciting project. We uh, have a lot of fun with it uh, and uh, we are certainly looking for more people to get involved. So if this looks interesting, um, please, yeah, please contact me, contact the entire team. Um, we will be very, very welcome. And thank you so much for listening. Um, haven't seen any questions coming up, so uh, that's why I kept going. Uh, but if there are any questions now, Okay, well, wow. uh, once go and twice. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I would like to thank our attendees so very much for being with us and uh, thank Mandy for such a wonderful presentation. Thank you.